You're listening to Standing Before the Mass podcast with Chris Heaton, sponsored by Newport Nautical Supply. Hello, welcome to another edition of the podcast. It is late April as I record the introduction to this podcast, and there has been a bevy of activity of people getting their boats ready. Mooring balls are popping up like daffodils, although the daffodils seem to be having a bit of a retreat due to the colder weather that we seem to be having, which is typical for Newport in the spring. Anyway, my guest for this episode is Christopher Pastore. Here are some Christopher facts. And I'm going to read this right from his website, and I'll provide a link for that. Christopher Pastore is an associate professor of history at the University at Albany, State University of New York. He holds an MA and a PhD in American history and an MS in college teaching from the University of New Hampshire, as well as a BA in biology from Bowdoin College and an MFA in nonfiction creative writing from the New School for Social Research where he has taught courses in the writing program for 14 years. Focusing on early American environmental history, his most recent book, titled Between Land and Sea, The Atlantic Coast and the Transformation of New England, Harvard University Press 2014, examines Narragansett Bay watershed from first European settlement through the early 19th century. As a journalist, he has contributed articles on sailing or related topics to the New York Times, Boat International, Cruising World, Newport Life, Offshore, Restoration Quarterly, Real Simple, and Sailing World, where he worked as associate editor. He also served as editor of American Sailor and Junior Sailor, the official publications of U.S. Sailing, the sport's national governing body. In 2005, he published a biography of Nathaniel Harishoff titled Temple to the Wind, the story of America's greatest naval architect and his masterpiece, Reliance. And I've read both books. I began this by contacting him because I wanted to talk about Temple to the Wind. And then he very kindly sent me a copy of Between Land and Sea. And I got stuck into that. And that's where the podcast goes. If you've ever sailed or cruised Narragansett Bay and you've wondered what it was like a long time ago, Chris takes us back in time. And we look at Narragansett Bay the way the early settlers would have seen it, the way the natives interacted with it. And he's really done his research on this. It began as an academic pursuit, but it garnered enough interest that it became a book. And he explains how that all happened. It's available at Harvard University Press's website, and I will provide a link for that in the notes. Anyway, I thank Chris. We had a great chat, and I hope you enjoy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, thank you for sending me the book. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. Well, I'm <laughs> glad you read it. Thank I, uh, I I appreciate the little dedication in the in the front there. Oh yeah, good, good, yeah, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thank you. I, I I don't have many books uh, actually addressed to me. Yeah, I had picked up uh, Temple to the Wind and yeah. started rereading it. My dad, I think, had given it to me a number of years ago. And then I've got to say, I didn't reread Temple to the Wind because I got in, I got engrossed in this yeah cool. Uh, how did this uh how did this come about uh with the uh between land and sea between land and sea i'm sorry yes for the for the listener uh <laughs> your book between the land and between land and sea so i'd ri- written uh in 2005 i'd written temple to the wind right the story mm-hmm. of america's greatest naval architect and his masterpiece reliance right and it was a story of nathaniel harrisoff uh and it's it's a biography of, of harrisoff and and um and kind of his rise in the world of uh, fast flight yacht design. And as I was writing that book, at the time, I um, I was wor- working at Sailing World magazine, and then I um, I went off and I did uh, an MFA in creative writing, uh, in nonfiction creative writing at New School University uh, in New York City. And in that process of writing that book, I, you know, I, I realized one that I, I liked it and I loved doing the research and I loved digging through letters and, uh, you know, I've, 
uh, and, and putting the whole book together. It also made me realize, though, that I wanted to do more. And I wanted to start to think historically in perhaps more complex ways. And so um, after writing that book, my wife and I were actually living uh, in Prague in the Czech Republic, and she was teaching at the American International School there. And I was writing, doing freelance articles, and, and uh, I'd been working on that book, uh, the Hershoff book. But I realized I, I really wanted to learn how to write history that was uh, uh, more kind of grounded in, in what had been written before and, and more grounded uh, in kind of deep historical research. And I also realized that I, I, I was interested in the environment. All right? And I think that's why I'd, I'd gotten into sailing in the first place, right? I, you know, I, I just, I've always loved the ocean and I've always loved, you know, I've, I've always had an interest in environmental concerns and, and, and things like this. And so what I decided to do was to go back to grad school again uh, and do uh, a PhD in history. And so I went to the University of New Hampshire, and, and there I did a, a PhD in American history with a focus in early America and the Atlantic mm -hmm. world. So that book, Between Land and Sea, was uh, the first draft of that book was my doctoral dissertation. And you know, I spent uh, five years at the University of New Hampshire, and um, uh, I wrote uh, the, the doctoral dissertation, and, and it, it went well. The, the dissertation won... Uh, it was a, uh, the, actually the runner-up for a prize called the Alan Nevins Prize, which is uh, the prize for the best American history doctoral dissertation in the United States. And with that, um, I had some interest from publishers. Spoke with uh, Harvard University Press, and, and they, they decided uh, to publish it. And so that was the genesis of, of that Mm. Um, of that book, uh, but really, it you know it's it's called Between Land and Sea, but it's really um, it's rooted in Narragansett Bay, and and I, the reason I I wrote about Narragansett Bay is because I, I one I love it, and and mm. two um, I know it, I know I I've I've spent ever since I was a little kid I've been messing around on the bay, and uh, I I feel like I I know all the little inlets and outlets of it pretty well, and so. Uh, it's also well documented in terms of the uh, historical record. So I was able to kind of, you know, mine the historical record and, and, and tell this story of uh, this environmental transformation there. Yeah. When I, when I first started reading, it, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm reading it. And every now and then my wife would see me either flip to the back and then maybe pick up my iPad and look something up. And she said, are you reading the book or are you playing on your iPad? And I said, no. <laughs> And I realized it's going to take me forever to read it. I was chasing down every single one of your footnotes. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. You would, you know, where do you get that? You know, I, it, it is fascinating. My first takeaway, which sort of blew my mind, was just how, I guess, swampy and littoral and marshy it was from what we know as the Bay inland. Yes. When, in, the, in the, you know, we're talking 16th, 17th century before we started really messing with it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, this was a, a very marshy place. And, uh, you know, if we go back into the, say, 16th and 17th or 18th centuries, um, and we talk about the idea of a coast in general, the coast was, you know, ten, now we tend to think of a coast as um, this kind of immediate area along, along the shore. Um, mm. Where coasts were imagined at the time as something extending, perhaps as far inland as the smell of the sea would go when the wind was just right. Uh, it, you know, it was a coast was kind of this indeterminate space again between land and sea uh, that was connected through again the myriad inlets and outlets of an estuary. And this book is really organized around the concept of an estuary, which is. Mm -hmm. um, like Narragansett Bay um, it is is a uh, a space that's at once flooded by the ocean, but also uh, filled with freshwater uh, coming from uh, the major river systems that flood it. And so, yes, it, it's it's a there's a it's a vast network uh, surrounding right. Narragansett Bay of all these little tiny inlets and outlets. One of the things that really jumped out was how English settlers really wanted to start messing with it, transforming it. Whereas the the natives seem to really work more with what existed already. Yes, I mean, and and I think both groups had very different ways of interacting with their environments, and even just naming their environments. Um, uh, where Native Americans 
uh, Wampanoag and Narragansett had ways of naming their environments that were kind of in, in accordance with perhaps the, the word we might use today is the ecosystem services that are available uh, in that area. Right. So it might be a place of water uh, of rushes, the place of uh, a salmon creek, a place of uh, birch trees, uh, th- that mm. type of thing uh, would would uh, kind of created this, uh, as the historian uh, William Cronin has, has said, a, a kind of an ecological mental map of, of an area. Whereas uh, Europeans kind of came in with their place names and um, which tended to be uh, uh, European names, uh, people mm. uh, um, prom- of prominent people, and so you lo- kind of like lost that ecological mental map. As a result, people were uh, perhaps more extractive uh, in their approach to using the landscape. Uh, at times, uh, they're catching all the fish. At, to- at other times, they're cutting down trees. At other times, they're grazing animals across vast stretches of places like Aquidneck Island. Um, mm. and, um, and, and that changes the place for sure. Right down to, uh, I guess, in, in introducing their own seeds from Europe to Absolutely. generate the grass that they want for the grazing, which then has a negative impact on, uh, on the water and as it washes into the watershed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, these are invasive species that kind of take over mm. uh, and, and change the ecology of the place. So, um, you know, this is in small ways and it happens over hundreds of years. But one of the things I'm trying to show in the book is that all of these uh, small changes, uh, again, accumulate over time uh, and they actually change the nature of this uh, ecotonal or space between ecologies they, they mm. change this environment in, in, in important ways. Yeah, the other difference that jumped out at me was the tendency for a European to decide on a, on a boundary by just sort of drawing a line right through the woods, or whereas the, the natives would be more inclined to use a feature, a geographical feature. Y- yes, absolutely. To create that boundary. Yes, yeah. ex- exactly. In, in one chapter in the book, um, I actually talk about the boundary between Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the, so the eastern boundary. And th- that was actually one of my f- favorite chapters to write because I'd found um, it was a series of proceedings uh, that were at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. And uh, it was a series of proceedings uh, about this from this boundary commission uh, that was in uh, 1741 dealing with uh, this, uh, who owned what on the eastern shores of Narragansett Bay. By 1741, both colonies um, were practically coming to blows. Uh, Rhode Mm. Island had actually almost come to blows with, or actually had come to blows with Connecticut, uh, where actually some people had died in boundary boundary disputes right around the turn of the 18th century. Um, But by 1741, the boundary between uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, according to uh, the state's, or sorry, the colony's charter, uh, it was uh, set to three English miles east and northeast of Narragansett Bay. But no one really knew where Narragansett Bay was. Again, this is kind of a maze of uh, of tidal estuary. Uh, And so where did the bay begin? Where did the bay end? When did it become a river? Uh, A lot of our tidal rivers to this day are still called rivers, uh, but they're uh, affected by the flood and flux of the sea. And so, um, again, where where were they going to draw this line? And so what they did is, they, uh, and, and this is what I found at the John Carter Brown Library, was this collection of depositions about um, uh, trying to understand how people understood that eastern edge of Narragansett Bay. And what I found was that uh, people came uh, with their answers. Their, well, their answers were shaped um, by their politics, whether they sided with Massachusetts or whether they sided with Rhode Island, by their religion. Okay, so whether they were Qua- the Quakers tended to side with Rhode Island, and mm. Quakers tended to be often uh, not in the good graces of people in Massachusetts Bay. They uh, often sided uh, their, their whether they their occupation might uh, shape their understanding. So whether they were a ship captain. Uh, whether they were a coastal farmer, uh, all of these things uh, were shaped. Uh, and so the boundaries of uh, what constitutes a bay and the boundaries of 
Rhode Island and Massachusetts were created uh, not by some, uh, again, geological reference point or something like this, but, you know, um, by convention, um, by through politics, through religion, uh, through uh, personal beliefs and experience. I thought that was a, a pretty interesting way of, of kind of reimagining by placing placing the bay on the map. Yeah, I, I did enjoy that section. In fact, I, I think I reread certain parts of it because I was trying to understand where exactly, and it was shifting. One account being from Montauk all the way to Gay Head or Aquinnah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's and a so, pretty, and that was um, uh, a Rhode Islander uh, naturally uh, believed that right. uh, uh, that that Narragansett Bay extended from Montauk to Gay Head. Uh, Massachusetts people uh, would uh, imagine uh, Narragansett Bay. Uh, some some of the depositions uh, imagine Narragansett Bay as between like just the West Passage, for instance, mm. uh, something really narrow. Or sometimes they would talk about the West Passage and the East Passage. But of course, the Sakonet River was not par- part of Narragansett Bay. But over time, um, they uh, they kind of uh, through much uh, back and forth, ultimately decide that the Sakonet River is part of Narragansett Bay, and that they would draw the line three English miles east of of the Sakonet River. Uh, and this is where we get the addition of Tiverton and Little Compton into right. uh, into into Rhode Island. With geopolitical events on the mind, I like that it made it all the way to King Charles II in that he started to hear about it and get concerned that it might be an opening for the Dutch or somebody else. They couldn't settle it. Somebody else would make some sort of an inroad and, yeah. and lay claim, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, um, it, it could it could. Uh, help the Dutch. It could also help Native Americans uh, who mm. were also in a position of, you know, were, were vying for power within this colonial or intercolony contest. Um, and so the other thing that was interesting in the de- depositions is that not only are they uh, uh, speaking to uh, contemporaries, right, people who, in, in the 18th century, but then they're also going back to the colonial records and they're looking at uh, people who knew. King Philip from fame from King Philip's War. They they knew people who uh, were friendly uh, with the Wampanoag. Uh, were fr- they wanted to know where the village of Patuxet was? I'm uh, sorry. Um, yeah, the village of Patuxet. They wanted to know mm-hmm. where the range of those Native Americans were, uh, and that became an important part in actually drawing that line as well. Um, and so, again, uh, the at a certain level in this process of trying to uh, lay the lines of this kind of greater colonial project, um, they're looking back to, to how Native Americans understood the landscape uh, as a way to uh, bolster their claims. Uh, so that was, I thought, um, in many ways, uh, kind of ironic. But ultimately, you know, one of the things that the book is trying to do, um, we've used, we've right now spoken about some individual chapters, but the overall argument of the book is that over time, between the 17th century, uh, with the establishment of colony of Rhode Island, and the 19th century with with industrialization, what we have is in, in this kind of indeterminate estuary, we have this transformation of something that had been ill-defined and perhaps an undulating coast into a more clearly defined edge or a coastline, mm. and that's a term that actually doesn't come about until the 19th century, and. As, with all these little changes, whether it be changes to mapping, whether it be changes to the uh, economies of uh, extraction, changes to wh- what you're growing, what you're chopping down, all of th- those changes over time uh, are part of this transformation from a coastal margin to this more clearly defined edge or coastline. And by creating a coastline, it makes the coast less resilient. Uh, mm. It makes it less capable of, of absorbing the blows of, uh, of human initiative. Uh, it makes it less capable of rebounding. And so whether it be up in Providence and going up uh, the Blackstone River or down uh, along the coast of Newport and up Quidnick Island by, again, taking that marshiness out, taking that mm. that sogginess out and filling it with cement or filling it with stones, that, again, it it has uh, it has an effect. Again, we've we've continued to do that right. through the twentieth and twenty first centuries as well. 
in regard to the Blackstone River, I had no idea that there was such competition between uh, the Massachusetts Bay economy and ours for that water resource. Yes, right. Yeah, absolutely. So the final chapter is about um, building the Blackstone Canal between uh, Providence uh, and Worcester. And creating uh and at this time it's it's massachusetts it's their states right uh it's massachusetts mm. and rhode island and, and um they come together uh with a canal corporation but again as you point out there's a lot of competition between massachusetts and rhode island about who's going to benefit from this connection uh by ex- essentially extending narragansett bay all the way up into apple country at certain points, Massachusetts uh, is uh, bristling because uh, they feel like this could take away commerce from Boston. Boston wants to build a canal; it is competing to build a canal to Worcester. There's the idea, you know, th- th- again, the two states are uh, at odds about this, but ultimately, it's a private corporation that does it. And they build they, they build this canal, and what's interesting is they they have such great faith that this canal will work and that they can manage every drop of water in the Blackstone Valley. At the Mm. same time, however, uh, the Blackstone Valley is essentially the the heartland of American industrialization, right? It's where Samuel Slater sets up his first mill. It's where uh, mills proliferate all the way up to Worcester. Uh, And so there are a lot of mill owners who need that water as as well as the Blackstone Canal Company that needs that water. And so they send in uh, experts to figure and quantify it all. And at the Rhode Island Historical Society, they have boxes of essentially math (laughs) where they were just trying to (laughs) figure out um, how much water was available and how much water would be available. But as was often the case in the 19th century, uh, 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 we could even extend that and say as, as often the case in human history, they didn't account for all the factors and they don't account for natural variation in the weather. Mm. They don't account uh, account for human error. They don't account for the fact that every canal lock might not be perfect. And they can't make it all work. There's times when the canal is too low, ships and ships, but it's, it's, it's boats can't get through. Uh, there's, there's times when the canal's frozen and boats can't get through. And ultimately, they don't anticipate the coming of the railroad, uh, which uh, transforms uh, again, not only the shore, but uh, transforms uh, the movement of goods up and down that Blackstone Corridor uh, for good. Right. And you point out the revenue drops from the canal after the appearance of the railroad was dramatic. Exactly. So the the, the canal effectively goes bankrupt uh, after the coming of the railroad. Then it is transformed once again from this canal, this transportation route into a giant sewer. Uh, and uh, it becomes the place all these factories along the canal route are uh, dumping everything from industrial dyes to other kinds of uh, waste. And uh, that flows down into Providence. And at one point by the early 20th century, they're talking about uh, the water coming down in through Providence as uh, like the color of rust. Uh, it's just so uh, yeah. dirty. And that really transforms the, uh, transforms the upper edge of Narragansett Bay. Uh, so that by the early 20th century, um, there is even reports by fishermen saying that there's a, an actual line in the bay. As you go south along the bay, you know, perhaps around Prudence Island, there was a a, a, a visible line of filth. Fisher, shell fisheries, in particular, uh, were um, uh, were decimated because of that filth, uh, because of that pollution. Uh, and south of the of that line, um, things were still moving, but it really it really transformed the place. One of the anecdotes that you pointed out with regard to the Blackstone the canal system was these. It was a black. Was it a blacksmith and a farmer who decided to build up a bigger a bigger dam in the hopes that the water would back up against the Slater mill uh, because it had negatively impacted their operation. At at one point they had a trickle or nothing. Right. Uh, Exactly. Yeah. So people, there were like um, essentially dam wars uh, as, as uh, you know, people are trying to back water up onto other people's raceways and, and stop the flow of water so that uh, they couldn't operate. Uh, other people were knocking down each other's dams uh, as a way to get flow to move down. And so then uh, there's a, a whole series of legal cases, some of the most important that actually transform the way 
uh, uh, tra- transform American law uh, and, and, mm. and business law as well. So uh, water law plays an important role in this um, almost rethinking during the 19th century of uh, the common good. During the 18th century, there were laws put in place that ensured farmers had access to, say, salmon or alewife, uh, blueback herring, those types of fish that were coming upstream in the spring. And anyone who put a dam in would have to put in a fish ladder or some some way to allow, or they would have to take the dam down at certain times uh, to allow mm-hmm. those fish to pass through. By the 19th century, the common good wasn't necessarily for the little guy. It wasn't necessarily for the farmer uh, who relied upon those fish coming upstream. And so uh, the common good uh, is transformed into uh, something where um, the mills are the common good. Uh, the, they're, they're the drivers of the economy. Uh, mm-hmm. And it even comes to the point where you know some uh, commentators say that w- why why even you shouldn't be toiling away on your farm. Like the, if you want to serve the common good, you should, you should go work in a factory. Right. And, and, uh, uh. you know, and so, um, uh, that's kind of, it, it, there's this wholesale transformation and again, what, what, uh, produces the, the commonwealth, what, what produces the, the common good for, for everybody. I haven't followed it closely. So I'm speaking very loosely here, new legislation. It's going to define public access to the to the water it's being fought or opposed by specifically maybe landowners uh and it has to do with public access and 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 making that clear and i think i just read something briefly but it could have an impact across the country if it's if it's looked at as some sort of precedent yeah i mean i'm i'm not i'm not Exactly sure which are you talking about Rhode Island specifically or are you talking about Rhode Island specifically? Yeah, okay, it's yes. it's just in the news in the last week or so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I believe they've they've finally agreed. I, I haven't read the article, but I believe I believe they've agreed on uh, where they're going to set the line for public access. Right, which, and it's right. there's some some opposition, and as you'd imagine. Right. Exactly, and so in some cases, you know, the the difference is each state has different laws. Um, there are laws, you know, in terms of Massachusetts has different laws than Rhode Island. Massachusetts is to the lowest tide mark. Rhode Island, I believe, is 10 feet above the highest tide mark. Is that what they were saying? I think so. And I, I, if I read it correctly, I thought it was 10. I think the 10 foot number is correct. They wanted to make that more established and there were people that were opposed to it. And they, <laughs> I think they had band together in some fashion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Ex- ex- yeah. As, as is the case. So this happens, uh, you know, in, in, uh, uh, places across the country, it's happened in California quite a bit, um, as people are looking for beach access for surfing, you know, for, for um, so on right. and so forth. People are building, uh, giant mansions, uh, and cordoning off the shore. It's a, an important and involving issue. I just want to jump back where we kind of went to the current timeline. There was, um, an object called the sea quadrant or Octant, uh, and you had mentioned that it was at one point at the was it at the uh, Redwood Library? Or uh, uh, it was ac- actually at the John Carter Brown Library. Uh, so, it, but but it was it was, it was uh, created in Newport, but they have it at the John Carter Brown Library. Uh, it's beautiful. And it, is it still there? Uh, yes, I, yeah. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe and that's there. significant because that really positioned us uh, at a recognizable scale, at least from a scientific perspective. Exactly, exactly. And so, um, you know, in terms of uh, establishing Rhode Island or and, 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 and Narragansett Bay as a place of science, it put, um, you know, they, they, were, they were interested in examining the, the transit of Venus. And by using um, uh, scientific instrumentation to measure that, uh, and then writing it up and contributing to this uh, broader imperial British imperial culture of letters, um, they're able to put Rhode Island on the map scientifically. You think of New England as kind of, you know, in the Americas more broadly as being um, very much on the imperial periphery. Uh, it's a place, mm. uh, it's, this is the boondocks of empire. And uh, to contribute to uh, this kind of important scientific investigation, the type of stuff that's happening out of the Royal Society in London, uh, that uh, very much put Rhode Island on on the map. Yeah, because they weren't able to see it, I guess, in Europe due to cloud cover or atmospheric conditions, but it was documented here, the transit of Venus. 
Yes, absolutely. Exactly. So it, 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 they, they were able to do that here. Yeah. I'm just looking for, I thought I'd taken notes. There were these characters. I, I, I thought of them as characters as I read your book that went around sort of mapping it, but it sounded more like a drunken cruise. Uh, <laughs> they went around the bay defining things and, and making observations. And I, I just got a kick out of that and thought, well, if I'd lived in that era, I would have been among that gang. <laughs> yes. They had a small boat and they traveled um, as essentially um, from Connect the Connecticut border uh, along the coast of Southern Rhode Island, up into Narragansett Bay, all the way up to Providence, and then working their way down south all the way to South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. And mm. um, uh, so they did this over a long time. I, I, who knows? Uh, it seems like, like in their in their uh, their record of the of the trip, they did stop off at uh, many different places for drinks and things like this. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't totally, we, we, we don't really have a, a detailed record of, uh, you know, their antics on the boats or, or anything right. like that. But effectively, this was part of this, tri- this, this attempt to map Narragansett Bay, to figure out where the boundaries of the bay were. And uh, whenever, uh, or it was customary for the time to, uh, whenever you're doing a survey, uh, to at once create the map and to create to have a surveyed log where you were mapping and, and the measurements along the way, mm. uh, but then to also create a a narrative account of it, something that, right? Yeah, the um, literary scholar uh, Martin Bruckner has called a geodetic writing. They were keeping um, in, in this kind of geodetic uh, writing. They were um, it, they wrote it in verse. Uh, it was a horrible poem, uh, but uh, they, they 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 wrote this long kind of uh, poem about their uh, voyage around Narragansett Bay, which was uh, pretty entertaining. Wow. There was one book, and I don't know, you might have come across this. I was flipping through the, the opening pages of Eldritch one day, about a year ago, and they actually referenced some of the observations that Eldritch made. And he had based some of his research on this book, which was written by Edgar Mayhu Bacon. Okay. It's out of print, which is why it looks like this. And these were his observations. You can see it's a reprint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, It's called Narragansett Bay. It's Historic and Romantic Associations and Picturesque Setting by Edgar Mayhu Bacon. And it's considered important, so the government reproduces it. Yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. this in this format, but it was some of his observations, I guess, of tidal flow, and he talks about the Gatsby affair, and they talk about different things. But it it's almost like somebody's logbook, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and you know, particularly for something like Eldridge, um, you know, they can they do a pretty nice job of of um, the math to make sure that they 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 know mm. when tides will be ebbing and flooding. Um, and and how they're going to flow through s- certain areas, but that that specific that how it's going to flow through a certain arm through a certain gut between two islands, things like that. So much of that is based on individual observation and just compiled over time. Um, if mm. you look through Eldridge, it's it's kind of arrows with you know kind of right. vectors uh, of, of 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 flow for certain times uh, and kind of just. The direction, you know, like this yeah. is where it's going to go. And so a lot of that, um, it's not, they're not gauging all of these places. Um, it's, it's based on a lot of uh, firsthand accounts, firsthand observation. Again, that's just compiled through time. And that's, I, I think as a historian um, who's, you know, interested in um, the history of the sea, there's so much of that knowledge uh, that is, uh, again, based on observation, and this goes all the way back. If we go back to the 16th century, um, mm. so much knowledge about the ocean is based on personal observation, and then it's um, put into print, and that print is circulated and reconstituted into into different formats. And you know, they've been producing rudders or in various like uh, coastal guides and maps uh, for a really long time. Uh, and so, you know, the mm. Eldridge is kind of like the uh, it's our go-to guide now, but uh, it's it's a right. product of centuries of, of of observation. That's one of the nice things about it. Also, not just the the empirical data that's in there, but all the other narrative information that is still in that book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Talking about navigation, 
we, t- we start to talk about lighthouses. You, you mentioned the importance of positioning of lighthouses and and how it how symbolic it was both economically and and for the for the whole bay. Yeah, exactly. In the same way that a scientific instrument uh, kind of puts Narragansett Bay on the proverbial map or Newport uh, on the proverbial map, uh, a lighthouse at the end of Beaver Tail uh, can do the same thing. Uh, it's uh, this beacon uh, shining, uh, sending a, a message that this is not some empty uh, wilderness, you know, if you mm. will, or something like that. That 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 this is actually a uh, an inlet of the ocean that's open for business. And so, building a lighthouse and hiring a lighthouse keeper, and you know, keeping that lit, uh, did much to kind of establish uh, the legitimacy as, of Newport as you know one of the. It, it was one of the uh, five biggest cities uh, along the what is now the U.S. East Coast, you know, along with Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Charleston. Mm. Uh, it, so, so building that lighthouse was very important. If it only played a small role in, uh, you know, uh, actually lighting uh, the, the tip of Beaver Tail, it never, nevertheless played a big symbolic role. And in, in, um, yeah, because I think you mentioned it wasn't very bright initially. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, it was the Fresnel lens hadn't been invented at that point, or not if yet, it had, not, it hadn't made it here. Yeah, yeah, not yet, not yet. But yeah, no, it nevertheless uh, played a. a, a Powerful role. It shined shined a light uh, towards business, and this was mm. one of the things that um, you know played a role in in in, in shaping Narragansett Bay. It was a place that had always been uh, oriented towards the ocean, but one of the things that area around the bay, particularly the meadows around the bay, uh, were fantastic for ra- raising livestock. And so, as a result, by the 18th century, it really become like the garden of New England. And it was exporting things like horses to the Caribbean. It was ex- exporting sheep uh, and cows. It was, uh, again, uh, uh, much to the Caribbean, but to other places as well. Uh, and so Newport had become an important naval hub. There were a lot of ships moving in and out of the bay. Uh, and so, yeah, it was. And I don't think I realized before reading this book just how amazing Aquidneck Island was from a the perspective of growing things. It was just, it was lush, the soil, and it was just a, a bounty of, of growth. And of course it got ravaged by war and yes. it was unrecognizable <laughs> after that. But at, at one point at its peak, it was just this oasis. I suppose when Newport was, was the center of attention, not Providence, it was this oasis of growth and prosperity, but also the soil was so good. Yeah, so for the bulk of the 18th century, Newport was again this hubbing hive of, uh, of activity, and much of the commerce moving through Newport was uh, coming from this broader estuary. Animals coming on small boats, small lighters that are being they're being put onto uh, larger ships, uh, again sent to the Caribbean. Uh, naval ships are coming into Newport. Um, there's much talk in naval circles of how refined Newport is. It's got uh, it's got a synagogue. It's got a church. It's got uh, it's got the Redwood Library. It's got places where officers go and can go and and live comfortably. But during the American Revolution, Newport is and Aquidneck Island more broadly is just absolutely decimated. It goes from this garden of New England into a essentially like a moonscape. It's um, completely. Uh, demolished. Uh, there are ships during as as the French invade. Um, at one point, they, the English actually uh, blowing up their own ships uh, in uh, at the mouth of Newport Harbor to close it. There are books uh, being blown from the ships' libraries that clear across the island uh, that are landing miles away. Um, there are uh, uh, American troops uh, coming down from the northern tip of, of Narragansett Bay are, are fighting English troops. Uh, French troops are coming in on uh, French ships, and they pretty much cut down the trees. <laughs> they, uh, they're they even pulling up turf in some areas to burn turf. Uh, they're ripping up piers uh, to burn for firewood. The fence posts, houses are, are laid waste. Uh, again, it's the island is pretty much denuded. And it's so destroyed during the American Revolution in Newport in particular that after the revolution, it actually has a really tough time recovering. And 
Newport is, uh, it's, it's absolutely derelict. And some of the descriptions of it are of peeling paint uh, and broken windows. And uh, there's just, there's no activity. And this opens up an opportunity for, for Providence. Uh, this is uh, in that wake of the, of the American Revolution. This is where Providence uh, begins to become, kind of makes its rise and becomes mm. the uh, prominent uh, city in, in Rhode Island. It's only many years later that uh, Newport starts to rebound again. I think you even included a picture of a, basically a, a war-torn Quidnick Island. Yeah. that I, It must be in the, the library up in Providence, in the Brown Library. Uh, yeah, that one. Part of that I, I collection. Can, yes, I think I, I believe that one is from the John Carter Brown Library. I can't remember off the top of my head. So when I when I first contacted you, so you had indicated that this book also represented a sort of a change in the direction, or a, at least a new direction you'd like to pursue in in some of your research and writings. Yeah, so you know, I've been you know, I'm now uh, an associate professor of history at SUNY Albany uh, in Albany, New York, and this is a book driven field uh, history, right. uh, and and this is why uh, I pursued it, right? Because I, I I love reading these books and 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 I love researching them and and, and writing them, and so now I'm working on another book with a working title of A Thousand Thousand Slimy Things, Natural History of the Sea from the Bottom Up. And so oh, this, wow. one, this one goes a little bit broader and it's looking at the wider Atlantic world. Uh, and it's specifically looking at slimy things in the sea quite literally. Um, but it's also the slimy things in the sea is also kind of a, a metaphor. It comes at the term a thousand thousand slimy things comes from Samuel Coleridge's 1798 poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And uh, mm. in that poem, he's uh, somewhere sailing. Some the ancient mariner is sailing somewhere in the Southern Ocean and, and shoots an albatross. So many people kind of know this story, but he shoots an albatross, right. uh, and the albatross is that then, then uh, his crew is horrified and they hang this albatross around his neck. The crew die; they're haunted. They die. They turn into ghosts, and then his ship is becalmed, and he's in this utter state of despair. He's looking over the edge of the ship, and he sees up from the bottom of the sea this thousand, thousand slimy things swimming around him, and he's terrified. Uh, but ultimately, he continues to look down, and he sees um, what he calls a flash of golden fire. It's um, it, within these slimy things. It's with that flash of golden fire that he comes to see the beauty in them. With that, the albatross fo falls off his neck, the wind pipes up, and the ghosts of his crew sail him safely back to port. And the book is trying to understand that flash of golden fire, that idea that in these slimy things, uh, in a sea that we've made through our own, in some, some cases, pollution, uh, in a sea that we've made increasingly slimier with blooms <laughs> of jellyfish and algae and things like this, how we can see that flash of golden fire, how, how we can see that come to that appreciation so that we can take care of it in the future. So that's kind of what this next book is about. Is that in process now? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, I've been uh, scribbling all morning. So. <laughs> oh, really? All yeah. right. <laughs> so, oh, yep. That's good. And you mentioned when we, were, we had our back and forth about connecting, you have a boat or you're fixing up. Yeah. Do you have any plans to bring that to Narragansett Bay and cruise, or is that where you're gonna where are you gonna sail that? Uh, yeah, I, I hope to. Uh, well, I hope to come to Narragansett Bay, and 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 uh, <laughs> and right now it's in Maryland. Uh, we'll make our way up to Narragansett Bay, and then hopefully by uh, the summer we'll end up in Maine. So oh, that's, great! That's oh, so you've got a big cruise planned? Yeah, uh, that's that's the goal, and we're gonna we'll hopefully keep it up in Maine. Uh, and so that's kind of. Um, so I went to college in Maine. I went to Bowdoin College, and uh, okay. my heart, our big chunk of it, is still there, still up there, yeah, in, in Maine. And so uh, that that's the uh, spot that I'd love to spend some time. I've never sailed either to Maine or up in Maine, but I have worked. Worked. I I went out for one day on a friend's lobster boat, and I mean, we couldn't see a thing. <laughs> it was just, it was a it was a hard day of work. We had a good time, and but I was just amazed. I said, "Oh, I think it was in August, so of course, peak fog time." Yeah, I can confirm that the radar is working, so it should be it should be okay. <laughs> well, that's great. I'd like to include links uh, when I post the podcast in the show notes. What's the best way to link this uh, or you, and so people who are maybe interested could follow 
Yeah. So on the Harvard uh, University Press website is a link. You can, it, it's there. Um, I can also, why don't I just send you some links? How about that? Oh, that'd be perfect. Yeah. 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 And I'll uh, include them in the show notes. And yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks that'd again. This is, this has been brilliant. I really enjoyed the book and I appreciate the little inscription in the front. <laughs> uh, well, well, Chris, uh, thanks for, thanks for reading it and, and thanks for your support and your interest. Yeah. It's cool. Right on. Well, uh, cool. good to talk to you. It was great to talk to you and, and hopefully I'm going to be, you know, I'll be in Newport next time. I'll, I'll swing in and say hello. And uh, yeah, and, yeah. And stop in, say hi. All right. Well, that was my talk with Christopher Pastore. And again, uh, I will include this in the written notes for the podcast. To find the book Between Land and Sea, The Atlantic Coast and the Transformation of New England, the best way is to go to the Harvard University Press website. That's H-U-P, as in hotel, uniform, papa, dot harvard, dot edu. And then on the upper right-hand side, you can just type in the search box Between Land and Sea, and the book will uh, show up as an option. And Temple to the Wind, his book about Nathaniel Harishoff and the building of Reliance, that I, you probably get on Amazon. Uh, I've saw it in both paperback and hardcover there. Again, thank you to Christopher for spending the time uh, to talk with me. And if you want to learn more about him and his future works, you can visit ChristopherPastore.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R-P-A-S-T-O-R-E.com. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to Standing Before the Mass podcast with Chris Heaton, sponsored by Newport Nautical Supply. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.